Hello. Good afternoon. It's good to see everyone here. Hey, there we go. I've been reminded of many a times as, as we went through the day uh, in the comments that this feels kind of like Christmas in August, and I, I'm, a, I'm agree in agreement with that. Uh, a lot of smiling faces. It uh, feels good. It feels right to be here all together. Uh, and it feels right to have our audience uh, join us virtually as well. I uh, want to uh, give another opportunity to thank our sponsors uh, for helping us support and, and bring everyone together. Uh, and certainly uh, appreciate everyone being here through, through the duration. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to have our, our lunch keynote here on Monday, APA Corporation. Uh, join us. Uh, appreciate their support as well. Uh, APA or Apache is, is, offers a differentiated asset portfolio uh, in the Permian, uh, as well as the Eagle Herd here in the U.S., as well as international assets in Egypt, Suriname, and North Sea. I'm sure we'll get uh, a number of updates there on the international side. But through that whole diverse uh, portfolio, uh, the company is generated a, tr a tremendous amount of cash and a cash engine as it, as it puts that to work on its balance sheet and other, and other uh, plays. Here to, to uh, share a little bit of the APA uh, story is Gary Clark, VP of Investor Relations, and uh, please join me in welcoming Gary. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. And, and thanks to all the intercom folks, Aaron and Blanca and Kevin and, and uh, Prior to that, Greg Barnett. I, uh, so I'm a Denver guy originally. I started my career with a firm that some of you may know, Hannafin Imhoff. Started out in energy banking and then transitioned to the sell side, and I covered sell side EMP for about four years. And then from there, I went to the buy side and was a portfolio manager both in a long short environment and a long only environment for about 10 years. Last 10 years of my career has really been. Uh, leading investor relations departments, first for Chesapeake and then for Apache. I've been with Apache for about seven years now. Uh, down in Houston, I have to say it's really, really great to be back in Denver. Look for every excuse to get back here. And I want to thank Intercom for letting us do the key keynote and, and thank you for your interest. And, and I'd just like to echo that it's really great to see everybody in person. I think the last live conference I did was in December of 19. So uh, it's, it's been a long, long time. And clearly, uh, I forgot how to dress for a presentation. Somebody said I didn't wear a tie here, so forgive me for that. But um, so my background as a sell side analyst and being buy side as portfolio manager and in IR is, is a bit diverse. All of that has been in, within the energy sector. Most of it sectors, most of it has been within the E&P space. So you'll see a little bit of that uh, bleed into this presentation. I'm not going to be able to help myself. Um, I'm going to comment on valuations in the public sector, and so you'll have to bear with me. There may be a few salty comments about what we're observing right now, but I think it's important to see uh, where we've gotten to with the giant wall of worry now and, and this, where we are in the cycle. I think it's a great opportunity right now. I'm going to walk, for, for a few slides, I'm going to walk through that. So uh, this is just a hello from Apache's attorneys. I recommend you. I uh, used some leisure time to read that. There's forward-looking statements in this presentation. Uh, so three things. We'll keep this simple. I'm going to talk first about the, the higher-level energy sector performance in the public markets. I'm going to move on to a little bit of an Apache update. And then lastly, my favorite part will be some relative valuation considerations. Uh, of course, I'm a bit biased given that I'm the IR guy at Apache. Uh, but we're going to dig in a little bit there and talk about that. So let's just start this out with uh, the pain most painful chart in this presentation. I promise you the chart on the left uh, is, is a historical representation of the 11 S&P sectors. Um, this five-year underperformance for the energy sector, which if you haven't, can't see it, it's the one in the red, the only one in the red. This is the worst five-year performance of any of the 11 energy, relative performance of any of the 11 sectors in the energy, in the EM, or the S&P 500. Uh, so that's the bad. Uh, the good is that we're, we have a relatively good year to start the year. Uh, we've given a, up a little bit of our performance relative to the S&P, but we're still the leading sector. I don't know if that's changed today or not. Um, so perhaps we're turning a corner. Uh, this is actually probably my favorite chart, and I think a lot of you have seen some 
uh, version of this. Uh, what I like to look at here is the red line, which is the energy sector uh, representation within the S&P 500. And so for those of us who were in this business back in the late 90s during the tech bubble, uh, energy got down to an extremely low, low 5.5% uh, of the S&P 500. And I would note what's interesting is that oil prices were mostly sub-30 during that time frame when uh, it was making that bottom. But if we fast forward to today, we see an even, even more unusual scenario, which is energy is only 2.6% of the, of the S&P 500. And that's despite oil prices being two to three times higher. Lots of cash flow, lots of earnings, and, and I think pretty darn good fundamentals. Um, so as you reflect on this chart, look at the top line, which is the, this is the really what I call the hot sectors. It's communications, infotech, and, and, and consumer discretionary. And the reason I use all three of those is because the, today the, the, con, commu, the services and the consumer discretionary includes all the FANG stocks, Google and, and um, uh, Amazon and Facebook are, are in those sectors. They're not, it's not all about tech these days. Um, so if we had a bubble back in 99, I don't know what you call what we're looking at today. Uh, people have different views on that, but what I would say is it's, it's, this is a very stretched condition from a market equity market perspective. Uh, could last a lot longer, it's not a timing tool, uh, but I think the takeaway is it it's truly is a unique and very extreme condition. So let's take a look at, on the next chart, what happens uh, if we go back to 1999, what happened subsequent to that tech, bu tech bubble and see what the relative performance was of these sectors. So the energy sector, hopefully most of you caught this for the decade between 2000 and 2010. It was a great ride. And uh, it was driven by a lot of factors, oil prices, shales, and, and for, the, for the other three really hot sectors that were in a bubble, uh, not so much. So this outperformance was tremendous. Incidentally, it took until about 20, so I don't have the next 10 years, um, but it took about eight more years, so it took about till 2018 until those lines intersected again until the tech and the hot sectors overtook energy. So it took a while. And then once they did, and with the COVID impacts, it just skyrocketed and the black line went completely parabolic and the green line tanked. And that's where we sit today. So this is um, a, a chart courtesy of, of Paul Sankey, a longtime sell side research analyst who was kind enough to let me use this chart. I like it because it's in simplicity. Um, the black line indicates the contribution of the EMP sector to the earnings of the S&P 500. And it's really small. You know, we're a very small sector, so we're contributing about 1.2% to the S&P 500 earnings. But our weighting within that sector is about 0.6%. So our earnings contribution to the sector is double the weighting. So what this just tells you, doesn't tell you why we're so underweighted, uh, but it does tell you that we're delivering strong earnings, strong cash flow. And, and this is Paul's notation, not mine. He says, best looking EMP chart since the 2000s. And the, so what you want to see here is the black line going up above the blue line and staying there. That means they're delivering very strong earnings. The last time we saw that was really 2004 to 2007, and for those of you that were in this business, recall that was a pretty darn good time for energy stocks. So I think we need to sustain this earnings delivery, and I think if we do, uh, we'll move into a period of, of better performance and better representation within the S&P. Um, so the inverse of that, um, to whom much is given, much should be required. This is the FANG stocks, or the FAMGA stocks, however you want to refer to it. It's Facebook, Amazon, Apple. Microsoft, Google, which now represents 20% of the S&P 500, those five stocks, and they're only delivering about 13% of the earnings. There's a lot of ways to think about that. They're overowned, they're overvalued. I think most of the marketplace thinks that they're just going to deliver a lot faster future earnings growth than the rest of the S&P 500. Um, there may be some safety bid to this as well, but for whatever reason, um, they've got some catching up to do in terms of their earnings delivery. Um, so let me flip over now, make some comments on Apache. I'm not going to do uh, too much on Apache. You can go listen to our earnings calls and you can call me if you really want to talk about Apache. But I'll hit our three major areas, U.S., Egypt, North Sea, and then, uh, of course, Suriname is a hot topic and, and I'll touch on that. So before I get into exactly all the, the three areas, let me just frame what we did in response to COVID. Apache was really one of the most aggressive um, 
companies in terms of, of responding to the, to the COVID in March of 2020. Uh, so we suspended all of our drilling operations in the U.S. and uh, temporarily suspended our, our fracking activity. Uh, we deepened our cost-cutting efforts. We had gone into with a big cost-cutting program of $150 million is what we projected to cut in 2020. We ultimately cut, I think, close to $400 million, and that was really a direct result of the COVID, COVID impact and really needing to get our finances squared away and our business downsized properly. Uh, a number of measures to protect our balance sheet. We did go into COVID with, with relatively high debt relative to our peer group. It was a little over $8 billion. And uh, when we had negative oil prices, it, 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 it put us in a pretty tight spot. So we reduced our dividend 90%. And uh, we took steps to make sure we protected that balance sheet. Ultimately, uh, we took so much capital out of the business that we were able to generate free cash flow last year. Uh, which was a pretty big accomplishment. And so our net debt did not go up. And in fact, we opportunistically repurchased uh, a lot of our debt on the open market at a 30% discount to par. So I think we made some good steps uh, it, it, with regard to the, the COVID response. Um, probably the best thing we did was that last bullet, which is we spent a lot of time uh, conducting science work, mostly in the Permian Basin, thinking about our spacing, thinking about our frack designs, and really figuring out when we got back to work how do we optimize our programs so that we're hyper capital efficient? I think we did a great job of that, and you'll see that in a second. Uh, so the U.S., which consists mostly of Permian, is about 60% of Apache's production, or excuse me, APA. Um, we had taken our rigs down to zero. In February, we added one rig back, and then in, uh, at the end of June, we added a second rig back. Uh, we completed pretty much all of our ducks in the first half of the year, which was uh, just under 50 wells, I think 49 wells. Um, 43 of those were in the, the Midland, Delaware. Seven of those were at Alpine High. And I think all the work that I just mentioned that we did uh, has resulted in, in pretty exceptional outperformance relative to our uh, internal expectations on all of those wells on that well program. And as a result, we've raised, our, we've raised our U.S. outlook for the year, production outlook, pretty significantly. So I think we used our, our COVID downtime well. Um, we are con contemplating adding a third rig. That could go in one of three places. You can see on the chart we have sort of four core areas in the Permian Basin, Alpine High, which is, which is more gas and NGL prone, and then the other three, which are, are oilier. Um, you know, as we think about this third rig, we're going to be capital disciplined. All of these areas probably deserve to have a rig, uh, but it's a new world order. And so rather than putting in three rigs, we'll, we'll put in one somewhere. Um, what's not on this chart is our Austin Chalk uh, play, where we have a reasonably decent sized position in an area where some really good non-operated wells have been drilled. We just drilled four wells ourselves. It's our four first operated wells. And uh, those flowback results are looking pretty good. We may add, we may choose to add this third rig in the Austin Chalk. Uh, point is that we have a lot of places to add and they all have exceptional economics. Um, and then the last thing I'll comment here is the production. You can see we peaked fourth quarter 2019 pre-COVID, purposefully let our production decline substantially and uh, bottomed in one queue with the freeze offs, nice bounce back in two queue. And so we're going to look to get to a, a, a sustained level of production. We don't need to get back to the 299, uh, but you know, somewhere in the mid, mid 200s is a, is a good spot for us to be, and we'll be disciplined, and, and that's what you'll see from APA. Uh, moving on to Egypt, um, probably the most exciting region we have outside of Suriname. Um, we're the country's largest producer. We've been there two and a half decades, have excellent relationships with the government, never had any security. Uh, related downtime out there, and it's been a tremendous free cash flow machine. But if you look at the, the chart below, you see a pretty substantial decline over the last six quarters in our Egypt gross production. So what's happening there? Well, for the better part of four years, we've been investing at below maintenance capital levels because we've been capital constrained. Um, and so you've seen a, a, almost a 30% or about a 30% reduction in our gross production in Egypt. That's not because of the rock. That's not because of the geology. It's capable of doing far better than that. But it's because we've been investing below maintenance capital levels. Um, there's two reasons for that. Number one, for the last three or four years, we've been gaining new concessions over a million new acres from the Egyptian government that I think that's going to lead to some really attractive opportunities. And then we've also been shooting a big modern vintage seismic shoot across 
virtually that entire acreage position, which is uh, over 5.2 million acres. That's, that takes a long time. So we've been spending a long time working up our inventory, working up some really good prospects, and, and really waiting for what the fourth bullet point is on here, which is a modernization of our PSC terms. And I'm, I won't go too far into this, but essentially we have oh, somewhere on the order of 30 separate concessions within Egypt. They all have slightly different terms, um, and it creates inefficient allocation of capital across the country. So we've, we've spent the last year working very closely with the Ministry of Petroleum and the President and e EGPC and have come to an agreement that's going to move to Parliament that will modernize these terms. It will have broad reaching impacts, I think, on our economics and our capital allocation in Egypt. And uh, that decline that you see in production is going to turn around, uh, we believe, and uh, start, to, start to ultimately grow again. We'll be focused mostly on oil. We do produce some gas here, but uh, most of our margin is made on oil in Egypt. So very exciting. The modernization is targeted for hopefully sometime this fall. Parliament needs to ratify that, and uh, shortly thereafter, um, Egypt would, would then move to our number one area in the portfolio to put capital, and we're very excited about it, but uh, we need to get through some of that process first. Once we do, we'll come out with some more details for the marketplace to help everybody understand the implications of that, but very positive. So I'll touch on the North Sea quickly. Um, North Sea is our highest margin uh, business, very, very high realizations, a little bit higher costs, um, and, and we, we think we can run this business at 55 to 60,000 BOEs a day. Uh, it's kind of our smallest region, but uh, throws off a lot of cash flow. Uh, we, we have had some issues this year. We have two big maintenance turnarounds. We had to delay because of COVID all of our maintenance in 2020 on our platforms, not all of our maintenance, but our big pl platform turnarounds. And, and so that got pushed into 2021. And we have some big maintenance programs and a lot of downtime this, this year in, in the North Sea and had some compressor issues and some third party pipeline outages. So been a bit snake bit out there so far, um, but you see we're running in the low 60s, 1,000 BOEs a day, um, you know, 4Q to 4Q to 4Q. And then up until this year is when we kind of hit that operational maintenance wall. That's going to bounce back. Third quarter will bounce back a little bit. Fourth quarter will, will become much more normalized. So extremely high margins out here and uh, a lot of cash flow. We think we can run this business out pretty flat for a number of years. And we have some really exciting exploration opportunities there. So that brings me to Suriname. Uh, I'm going to purposefully keep my comments combined confined to what we've said publicly. I know a lot of folks want more information here and it'll come over time. But we've had four uh, discoveries. First one was announced in January of 2020. Um, our partner Total is now has the reins and is actually operating and drilling these wells. We drilled the first four wells as the operator. Uh, so four discuss discoveries, those are the stars that you see across the center of the block. And then our appraisal program has begun. We're on our third appraisal well, and those appraisal wells are happening where you see the drill rigs. One's at Sapakara, and one is at uh, what's called our Kaskesi prospect. Um, the Sapakara prospect we announced a couple weeks ago, that first appraisal well found 100 feet of uh, high quality, contiguous black oil pay in one zone. And um, for those of you that know offshore, that can have some pretty significant implications from a reserve perspective. But these are large, large geographic features, and so there's, there may very well need, we're going to need a flow test there, we're going to need some more drilling uh, to really assess how big this could potentially be, and then to move it ultimately towards uh, final investment decision. But we have said uh, that this was a very important step towards our goal of the FID. Uh, the other rig drilling there is at Kaskesi. Uh, that, that rig is still drilling. It's been drilling since late May. Um, that's an appraisal well to our dis Kaskesi discovery, and um, no, no information or up update for you on that today, but uh, as we move through the coming months, hopefully we'll hear something about Kaskesi. Uh, the one other thing I'll mention is we will move that rig that's on Sapakara, that is the Maersk Valiant drill ship, up to the very far north to our Bon Bonny prospect. It's a bit of a step out from where we've drilled our first seven wells. Um, but we're very excited about that. It's more of a deep water environment, 
uh, we're more on the slope, kind of through the middle of the block. It has different, different implications from a depositional environment and things like that, but uh, it'll be a, a little bit of a different kind of a well targeting the same age rocks, but we're really excited to get up there and see what that holds. So I will, we also have block 53, which I won't talk about. Uh, Apache's a 45% working interest and we're the operator and we'll drill a well there in first quarter of next year. So this was something we laid out, and I think this is probably the most important slide in the deck. We laid this out for the market on our second quarter call. Our CFO walked through this, a lot of assumptions here, but in effect what he's saying is at current prices, so if we take the prices for 2021, the oil and gas prices that we've averaged this year, and the forward strip prices, uh, we, we can generate about 1.6 to 1.7 billion of free cash flow annually for a, a number of years. And when he was pressed in Q&A, he said at least five to 10 years. And we can sustain our production flat and generate year in and year out that kind of free cash flow. Um, so how might we use that free cash flow? Some of it will obviously be revested back into Suriname. Some of it will go to dividends, cash return, and then ultimately, um, well, there'll be some debt pay down, some additional debt pay down, but then ultimately, if appropriate, stock buybacks, special dividends, variable dividends. I think the point is, Apache, I don't, I'm not sure the market understands our free cash flow generation capacity. So we're gonna provide more details through the back half of the year on this and get folks comfortable with that. Um, we've said we're focused on debt reduction initially, and so I think a lot of people expect that they're not gonna see any material cash return announcements from Apache, from APA um, anytime soon, but that's, that's not the case. I think you're gonna see us start to address cash return um, sooner rather than later. So, interesting little fact in the call out box, we could return our market cap in four and a half years with this kind of free cash flow generation. So I think very cheap. So let me get into what's probably my favorite part, the, or maybe it's my least favorite part, the relative valuation of Apache right now. And, and the, the spoiler alert is that it's cheap. Um, you know, this is a simple four pack slide. However you look at it, EBITDA, free cash flow yield, price to cash flow, price to earnings. Uh, the peer group is super cheap relative to the S&P 500 and APA is uh, much, much cheaper than the peer group arguably the cheapest stock in the entire peer group with a free cash flow yield of 27%. I, I struggle to come up with the right adjectives to describe these valuations these days. I landed on somewhere between silly and nonsensical. Um, if you're around back in 1999, these are cheaper valuations than we saw back at the bottom in 1999. So I think there's a good opportunity here if we can keep oil prices in a, in a fairly comfortable range and we don't see another uh, collapse. So this is just a few different ways of looking at this. This is on a price to enterprise value to EBITDAX, just showing you the gold bars Apache were towards the very end of the distribution in terms of valuation. Um, again, some say that one of the reasons we're undervalued is, or we have a lower valuation is because of our debt profile. Uh, true, we do have higher debt than our peers, but really when you look at it on this basis, which is our net debt to EBITDAX, uh, we're right in the middle of the pack. So we're, we're not excessively levered, but we do have some work to do on our leverage. Uh, free cash flow, which I think is the preferred market metric these days for looking at, uh, at these companies and their valuation. And these are, these are pretty incredible free cash flow yields. Uh, Apache leads the pack at over 27%. Um, and that's a lot of cash coming out. I mean, we, we could uh, make a decision at any point in time to a return a large portion of that cash, um, and it probably would have an impact on the stock. So how do you correct this condition? I've had lots of conversations today about, well, they deserve to trade this cheap, and that's, that's good cocktail bar chatter. Um, take a long time to unpack all the reasons why we trade here. I'm just trying to show you that we trade here, it's extremely cheap. It's the cheapest the group has ever traded. So this is kind of a fun example I pulled just to show if the market's gonna be really, really inefficient for any given period of time, there are ways to correct that. So Altus Midstream is a, is a company, midstream company that Apache, APA owns 79.2% of. So we effectively control this company uh, and, and we control the board of directors. 
Um, we took this out uh, several years ago via a SPAC. The stock languished uh, for a long, long time for a number of reasons I won't get into, but it ultimately got down below $10, right around where you see that red line coming in. That was November of 2020. At that time, Altus had a really good visibility into free cash flow, forward year free cash flow, um, and a lot of it, and s such that the free cash flow yield at the time was 86%. And it was just sitting there, nobody was buying the stock, and they had a free cash flow yield of 86%. So we looked at this and we said, we and Altus's independent board of directors said, how do we cure this condition? Well, we announced a $1.50 quarterly dividend, which at the time amounted to a 60% dividend yield, 6.0, not 6%, 6.0. And you can see the effect of what happened in the chart there. The stock went up five-fold within five months, and now it's up 7x from that time. So the, the point is cash, is cash return is king. I think we're hearing that from the market. Um, the market's not yet responding to that cash return, but I think for the broad group, if prices sustain here, we will be generating so much cash um, and returning that cash. We're going to catch the market by surprise. We're going to catch the, the investors that are way underweight, this group, by surprise. And, and they're going to have to respond to that. And, and prices will follow. So I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk about two companies. And two of our peers, you, you wouldn't normally see somebody stand up here and talk about their peers. Um, I'm going to do that because I think it's instructive for where Apache sits today. Uh, the peers I'm going to talk about are ones we're often compared to, and that's Marathon and Hess. And I do this in a very complimentary way. Uh, I'm not saying go out and sell your Hess and Marathon. I'm saying these companies have done an exceptional job telling their story and getting the market to value them uh, appropriately. So uh, the chart on the, on the right is not something I'm proud of, but I think it reflects relatively where we stand, Apache versus uh, APA versus Marathon. So the first thing you'll see if you look up in the left-hand corner is that both companies are about the same time size in terms of production and in terms of cash flow, okay? Um, the difference, though, is the net debt. We're, Apache's APA has been carrying $3 billion, round numbers, more debt than, than Marathon has. And uh, so we've had to go to work on our debt well, Marathon has had the opportunity, excuse me, has had the opportunity to work on communicating their long-term outlook. Um, in February, they put out a five-year outlook. They did a really nice job on it. The market recognized it. And then they followed that up with some pretty hard cash flow return commitments, which I think the market also likes and recognize. And you can see the result in February of 2021 is where Marathon really started to outperform Apache. So the, the message from our perspective is, look, um, yes, they've done all that, and they've done that uh, perfectly, and they've been rewarded for it. We're not far behind that. You know, we had to take care of our balance sheet, um, but our cash flow commit, our cash return commitments are coming. Uh, more detail on our five-year outlook is coming. So I think, you know, in the short term, we have an opportunity to look up, look a little bit like Marathon and make up some of this multiple performance and, and stock price performance. The second one is Hess. This is like a, a really exciting one. Um, Hess has been the best performing company in our peer group, and deservedly so. Again, if you look up at the, the top left, production, EBITDA, relatively similar size legacy businesses. Uh, Pat APA is actually a bit bigger, but um, comparable size. Uh, but, but Hess has a three, three X the market cap that APA does, and roughly the same debt levels. And so their enterprise value to EBITDA is, is five multiple turns higher than APA, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, if we, if our multiple was the same as Hess, that would be reflect about $20 billion of incremental market cap, and that's about $50 a share for Apache. Now, how do we get there? We, we, Hess is there, we're, we're, we're behind Hess in terms of our prosecution of, of our play in Cerno. So Hess has done a, a great job with, with uh, Guiana. And so if we look, um, their discovery, their first discovery at Lisa was made in May of 2015. And that's where the left-hand side of the chart starts. About two years later, they FID'd uh, their, their Lisa, their first project. And you can see the way the stocks performed. Um, up until FID, the performance was pretty much neck and neck between Apache, APA, and Hess. And then they just took off. 
uh, not long after FIDing their first project. There's a lot of factors that go into all of this, but I think my, my overarching point is you really have to, in my opinion and what I've heard from investors is, you have gotta get to FID on your first project before they'll start giving you credit um, for, the, for the upside potential that you, you're generating offshore. Um, so that's our goal, is to get to FID and to, to one day be like Hess. I think um, most analysts would tell you there's zero in APA's stock for Suriname, and I agree. Uh, you could argue there's negative value. So you could argue our base, base business is undervalued and we get no credit whatsoever for Suriname. I don't think anybody would argue that. Hess has about, 50, depending on what analyst you ask, round numbers about $15 billion in their, in their stock for Guiana, well-deserved. Um, but if, again, $15 billion to Apache would be about 40, 40 bucks a share. So we're about four, we, we drilled our first discovery about four and a half years behind after Hess. So we're, we're well behind them in the chain. But um, you know, hopefully we can catch up, we can, we can get to an FID and start to catch up. And uh, we could be a nice long-term hold if we have some success in Cernan. So let me finish off in returning to Paul Sankey's chart. Um, kind of where I had originally started, and that's the black line, blue line. Apache, APA is actually contributing very, very strong earnings uh, right now uh, relative to its weighting within the S&P. It's, it's hard to see from that scale, but uh, we're, we're contributing about double the earnings to the S&P than what we're weighted. So we're arguably undervalued based on our current, current earnings generation within the S&P. And then uh, that's Paul notes, Paul's notation in the gold. That's not mine. He says Apache equals bullish. They have both EPS upside and NAV upside. And the NAV upside he's referring to is the uh, call option on Cernom. So I'll sum it up and leave it there. I mean, I think it's clear that the sector is very, very cheap. I think we're seeing great capital discipline from the sector. And um, they're committed to returning cash. A lot of our peers have made hard commitments, and I think the market really likes that. You'll be seeing those similar type commitments from APA before too long, and, and hopefully that'll, that'll give us some catch up in our valuation. Um, we've made great progress on our debt. Uh, we just announced Friday night a, a, a completion of a $1.7 billion tender offer uh, that we've bought in um, uh, a lot of bonds. and so. Uh, Somewhere around year end, if current prices hold up and based on the cash flow guidance we've given, uh, we started the year with $8 billion of debt. Um, our net debt by year end should be somewhere around $6 billion. So very good progress uh, towards investment grade rating, and I think that moves us a lot closer to being able to return cash to, to our shareholders. Um, free cash flow is obviously very robust. I think we have strong visibility, and I think probably the, the point that the market at least the feedback I've had is, is, is most skeptical on is our ability to sustain production and those strong free cash flow rates for a number of years. I think we certainly have the inventory to do that. We need to show that to the market and we will demonstrate that over the, over the coming months and quarters. And um, you know, when, we, when we put our, our, uh, our inventory and our ability to sustain those free cash flow generation levels, I think that'll start to accrete into the stock price. And lastly, we've got the lowest valuation among our peers, and, and clearly, arguably, I think, the, the, most, the biggest catalyst that provides us the most upside in the form of Suriname, but I think also we've got an ad, a, a strong catalyst coming in Egypt with our PSC modernization. So a lot of this comes together as we move through the back half of the year. So if you're thinking about buying Apache, it's on sale. Um, <laughs> I put this presentation together, I actually priced this on Wednesday, and, a and we were at $19 and almost 50 cents. I think today we're trading at low 17. So we'd, in a few days, we dropped another 12 some odd percent on absolutely no news. Um, so that's my story. It's, it's obviously a bit biased, but uh, if anybody has any questions, if we have time, I could take those now. If not, uh, feel free to call me offline anytime and we can walk through the story further.
mean, there has to be one Suriname question, please. ESG, you haven't mentioned that at all. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think ESG is, is something that our peers and ourselves have coalesced around. And the, the publicly paid, it, here's my thought, the, the publicly traded peer group um, probably in this EMP sector has better resources and more scrutiny on it than anybody out there, um, save the European majors. So it, it, it behooves us to do everything we possibly can to clean up our scope one and scope two footprints. And uh, we're investing pretty heavily in, in doing so. Um, we were the first company to get to uh, to completely eliminate non-routine non flaring, routine sorry routine flaring in the Permian. Uh, we had, well we're not there. We said we would achieve it this quarter, so I can't say we're quite there yet. But the goal is to get there this year. Very aggressive goal, and, and I think we're the first of our peers to do that. I hope many of our peers will follow. Um, flaring is something that if you have the willpower to do it, it's pretty easy to eliminate. Um, our fresh water consumption as a percentage of our total water consumption is running around 3% this year. We were targeting 20%. So I think we're making really tangible um, progress. We're making really good progress on our health and safety metrics. We focus a lot on diversity and inclusion. Um, probably don't have time to get into all of that. But I spend uh, probably 30% of my time now in my job both on ESG strategy, I sit on our strategy committee, and then just interfacing with investors, taking feedback, uh, working directly on our sustainability report, all of those things. It's, it's important, um, it's, it's happening, it will only continue to be more and more of a focus. I, I will say this, the investment community, the traditional investment community, while they're very focused on it and they they um, need to have certain metrics met and they monitor those and they ask you questions about those. Um, I still believe that the driving force for investing in this sector is returns, right? So we're, we're profit-seeking enterprises, investors want returns. If we're delivering strong returns, um, that's the number one goal, but ESG is a close number two. Very important and I think, well, I'm very proud of our progress our sustainability report will probably come out in the um, October timeframe, and it's very thorough, and there'll be some new metrics, and, and uh, we'll be setting some aggressive new targets as we go forward. That was a good question. Sure, I'll make some IR guy level comments um, with apologies to Tracy Henderson, who's our SVP of, of exploration. She's fantastic and I wish she was here to answer the question. But what I will tell you is, um, as I noted, through the center of the block, we're a bit more in that slope transitional environment. You know, you go shelf, the way an off offshore depositional environment works, shelf, slope, transition, and then ultimately out into the deep water. Um, Bombani would be more of that deep water kind of fan system deposition. Um, it, as you move north, and we've all seen a lot of wells not work further north, north of our block, um, and we're moving 45 kilometers up to the north, I think, 40, 45, so it's a long distance. As you move north, um, you know, you're moving further away. Different people map the source rock differently, but you're moving further away from the source rock. And it becomes a function of have, have you had time for those hydrocarbons to migrate out of that source rock all the way up that, to those distances. And I'm not a um, technical expert on any of those wells that have been drilled, but my general understanding is uh, those lacked charge. Now there may have been a few that had charged from another source, but the, the source rock we map and the one that we think will, will charge Bonboni um, you know, lies further to the south and to the west. So I think as you move up there, um, charge is really, migration is really gonna be the key issue. It doesn't mean the other risks don't exist. You still need uh, fluid, you know, reservoir quality, you still need seal, you still need trap and all of those things. Um, 
but yeah, the further you move away from that known fairway where Staybrook and, and the center of Block 58 are, um, it, it does raise a little bit, little bit higher risk in terms of the migration. All right. Well, thanks for your time, everyone. Appreciate it. Gary, thank you. Uh, we'll be getting started upstairs at 1.30 with distribution now in Goodrich. So enjoy your conversations. Look forward to seeing you upstairs shortly. <laughs>